partner in organizing this this program uh, and your colleagues uh, professor sarsu bute professor liya katali khan and i want to recognize friends uh, some distinguished personalities who are in the audience his excellency richard bale consul general of canada and we have said mirza coming to our foundation for the first time and also kiran nagarkar i think he just left i don't know and we have uh, our friend from turkey from in dialogue foundation and uh, and we very recently had a an illuminating talk on uh, on what's happening in turkey and the the teachings of fethullah gule and how the teachings of people like fethullah gule who is a extremely influential religious personality from turkey can be a response to isis professor you know ambassador abhyankar made uh, some very insightful points in his in his talk the difference between islamic state and the islamic state of iraq and syria that is is and isis this difference is very important for us to understand because had it been just islamic state of iraq and syria uh, its global implications implications for india would have been quite limited but when it calls itself islamic state then it has the ambition of uh, speaking on behalf of the entire muslim community in the world essentially it is the new caliphate and that is what has uh, attracted a section of the youth radicalized youth in india across the world because there is this dream of revival of the caliphate you know that dream that idea it it keeps coming up again and again and whenever the ground is fertile it uh, asserts itself there was this interesting debate which i would have liked that debate to continue but uh, my friend wajudin is not here is the genesis of this in islam itself or in political islam and ambassador banker rightly clarified that it's a it's a it's one of the points of genesis is political islam friends those of us who have you know i have very limited limited knowledge of uh, islamic history but uh, what i understand is that there was no problem or there was very little problem when for certain reasons of compulsion prophet muhammad himself had to play a political role but after his demise each of the successors was not just a it, the first four successors was not just a religious leader but also a political leader there was of course division soon after his demise whether the it had to do with the succession of uh, abu bakr or omar or the next othman and of course it came to a head with ali becoming the fourth successor and thereafter the split happened but by and large there is a consensus that these four first four successors were rightly guided rightly blessed successors of prophet prophet muhammad but after these four successors disappeared from the scene what we have seen is a kind of a caliphate that has on the one hand politically expanded but also divided the muslim community again and again and again you 
you know, we in Mumbai have have played some role in this whole caliphate debate because in 1918, when uh, Turkey, it's, you know, which was the the seat of caliphate, the British Empire ended caliphate, and for reasons that we don't have to go into, our freedom movement led by Mahatma Gandhi associated itself with the movement for the revival of the caliphate. Of course, Mahatma Gandhi's understanding and approach was very different. We don't have to go into that. But Mumbai was the, the, the home to the Khilaf Khilafat movement. Ambassador Abhyankar also touched upon the role of Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, just yesterday, the king of uh, Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah, passed away, and he's been he's been succeeded by his half brother. But friends, what is uh, peculiar about Saudi Arabia is that consistently. Saudis have suppressed extremism or any kind of dissent in the name of Islam at home while promoting extremism, fanaticism all over the world. Through the Wahhabis, through the Salafis and of course India has been India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, all of us have been victims of what Saudis have exported, a kind of a very toxic political Islam that they have spread in India and in the, in the subcontinent and of course elsewhere too. Friends, in, you know, if you want to understand what's happening in West Asia now, the, the genesis, growth of ISIS, we can't be unmindful of the role played by the United States. The, the first Gulf War and of course the, especially the second war, invasion of Iraq, had absolutely no legal political justification, much less moral justification. The amount of destruction that the Americans caused not just physical destruction but the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq, it has not been sufficiently condemned by people in India. We still are somehow, a lot of people in India, they think that, you know, it's good that America is teaching these guys a lesson. You know, it's a, it's a big mistake that we are committing because neither America nor any other Western power can finish ISIS. And much of the problem in West Asia and of course in, South, you know, in, in parts of South Asia is because of the meddling that the Western powers, not just the United States, you know, have been having. You know, look at the way you know, Saddam Hussein or even Gaddafi, they were not really uh, role models for democratic govern governance. But what business did France have to unseat Gaddafi the way he did, the way France did, of course, in, in collaboration with other powers? You know, this is blatantly against international norms of, of, of conducting politics conducting international relations. The kind of resentment that it, it has caused is part of the reason why ISIS has grown. The anti-Americanism in most of the, you know, most of the Islamic world has to be understood by looking at the completely unjustifiable role that the United States and other Western powers have, have played and therefore I agree with uh, what Ambassador Abhyankar said towards the end that you know, nothing that the Western powers can do can destroy ISIS. This problem has to be confronted essentially by the Islamic world itself.
I also liked a very important point that Ambassador Bhankar made about pluralism in that part of the world, West Asia. I mean, it's, it really comes as a big, uh, uh, a very important learning for us that in a very small part of West Asia, just the border of Iraq, Syria, there are 70 Muslim sects, not to speak of non-Muslim heritage of West Asia, which unf unfortunately ISIS has been destroying. ISIS has been ethnically, religiously cleansing Christians from West Asia. You know, Iraq cannot be understood without the contribution of, of the Christian heritage. Syria cannot be... And, Jewish. and of course, Jewish. Historian. Yeah, of course. So pluralism, pluralism is an essential part of the, the identity of West Asia, each of the countries. And in this context, friends, I, for one, was very happy when just recently the Egyptian president, El Sisi, you know, he may have suppressed Muslim Brotherhood, and I think that he has good reasons to suppress Muslim Brotherhood in, in, uh, in Egypt. You know, he went to the Coptic church in Cairo. You know, Coptics represent about 8 to 10 percent of the Egyptian uh, population. He participated in the Christmas celebrations of Christians in Egypt and gave a very strong message that Muslim or Christian, we are Egyptians first. This is the kind of message that all the Muslim leaders in West Asia need to give. You know, I was listening attentively to what uh, a friend uh, Vajuddin said you know he should have been here to you know to listen to the responses you know all of us are essentially interested in knowing the implications for India a small section of the Indian youth has been radicalized but uh, in my opinion it has less to do with deprivation. You know, there are many communities in India or sections within each community that has been deprived in some way or the other. But the response is not the way radicalized Muslims are responding to something that's happening in West Asia. Now, this has to be understood by the appeal of the Islamic State, the appeal of the idea of caliphate, that there is one homogeneous worldwide Muslim community and it is destined to rule. This idea is what, you know, among other reasons, is what is propelling Muslims in, in different parts of, parts of the world to the idea of Islamic State. Of course, I agree with him entirely that there is a very strong sense of alienation among Muslims, Muslim youth, the political under-representation, or not just under-representation, but now next to zero, close to zero representation now politically, it's a matter of deep concern. Economically, very little stake. Socially, there's so much divide that the rest of non-Muslim society and governments have been doing very little to overcome. Now, governments at the center and the state have a big role to address this sense of alienation among Muslims. It is for India's own good that we must do this. At the same time, I think the Muslim community itself has a very important responsibility, which it cannot shirk, a responsibility to stop Indian Muslim youth from getting radicalized. So it is an ideological battle that the Muslim community has to wage in India too. You know, one important point the Professor Jondhale made, you know, I have, he said that India enjoys enormous goodwill in that part of the world, West Asia, which many of us here just don't understand. There may be tremendous anti-Americanism 
but let me tell you friends you know those of you who have visited that that part of it, the world there is zero anti indianism if anything there is tremendous goodwill for india why it is because of our our civilization of inclusivity of tolerance of pluralism and therefore indian government should i entirely agree that we should play a more active role not an act, not an active role that is an imitation of the role of the western countries but the role of very genuine peacemaker for too long you know we have towards is you know whether it's israel palestine or the rest of west asia our stand has been standoffish this should end we are a big nation we are the largest democracy in the world we have a responsibility towards the destiny of the world and therefore we must play a role we must play a role but that role has to be different from the role that western powers have been have been playing all this all these years creating and worsening the problem i have uh, one suggestion one idea that india's response should not be just india's response it should be a south asian response you know i wonder why sark for example has not been you know re reacting to the situation in west asia if oic organization of islamic conference can can say something about west asia if even brics summit you know the latest brics summit in brazil has adopted a very good resolution that makes the stand very clear on on the israel palestine issue on the entire west asia issue why is it that sark we are not able to speak out after all the largest concentration of muslims in the world is in south asia so we have to you know pakistan india bangladesh afghanistan we should evolve a common approach to the problems in west asia which affect us but lastly friends if we have to play a role ideologically confronting the islamic state it cannot be done by somehow encouraging directly or indirectly supporting the idea of hindu rashtra there cannot be a support for hindu rashtra and opposition to islamic state the two cannot go together you know we are we are a secular nation you know hindus muslims christians every single religion here every single community here has equal equal right constitutionally and not just constitutionally it is part of our cultural ethos india is india and india is not a hindu nation in it should not and it will never become a hindu nation of the kind that some people have been have been talking about so very illuminating talk and in the in the in the course of this talk by ambassador banker we have learned a lot you know i met him for the first time when he was ambassador in syria and i had an opportunity to accompany a former prime minister wajpayee to syria what a wonderful country and it really bleeds our heart to know that in that small country in the past 3 to 4 years 200000 nearly 200000 people have been killed millions nearly 25 or 30 or 40% have been rendered homeless and refugees you know syria is one of the cradles of human civilization and so is iraq these countries must be protected there must be peace and therefore all of us here and all the thinking people in india we must play a role thank you very much ambassador thank and you. thank you all and thanks to our partner mumbai university we'll do more and more work together thank you